right now, I'd like to welcome Steve to the stage um, to present about the power of bad ideas. Let's see if it has the microphone. It doesn't sound like I'm on at all. Am I on? All right. I can't hear it, but I appreciate the confirmation. Thanks, Joe, and everyone for, uh, for having me. It's, uh, it's nice to, to be here and uh, with you all on a Sunday. Um, all right, so let's, uh, uh, I don't know, know me or anything about me. Uh, here's what I'm not going to talk about today. Uh, user research. I, I'm, you know, a lot of people know me for the work that I do, which is around user research. Uh, uh, so here's things you can go buy or look up on the web or listen to. Uh, two books, uh, Interviewing Users and Doorbells, Danger, and Dead Batteries. Uh, so Interviewing Users is kind of a, a, I don't know, a primer text, I guess. Mm -hmm. And the, I mean, you can just find these on the web, but the Rosenfeld Media site has uh, talks and templates and lots of stuff you can go and sort of incorporate into your own practice. Doorbells, Danger, and Dead Batteries is uh, stories by, uh, different stories by 65 different user researchers about uh, the shit that happens when you go out in the world uh, to talk to people, including at least one uh, one Aussie, uh, Jerry Gaffney is in there. I don't know if anybody else, who else? I don't know if I'm missing anybody else, but anyway, he's he's in the book. Um, and then uh, podcast dollars to donuts, which is where I interview people inside organizations who have built user research practices or are running user research practices, which is a thing we didn't have in the in the in our professional world. Five six years ago, there were no uh, teams, leaders, you know, practices of substance, um, and now we have all these people that are just kicking ass around the world. So I've been talking to those people. All right, so that's the thing we're not going to talk about, but you have that to take away. So today I want to talk about uh, you know being bad um, and kind of unpack that a little bit. Um, there's sort of this creative impulse we have to. Uh, come up with things that are bad. So I want to look at what that is, sort of unpack it, um, and then talk about you know how we can leverage that, how we can harness that uh, more intentionally in the work that we're doing. So uh, bad. Um, when I say bad, I'm not talking about math. Like I mean, bad is like really bad. Um, and I, so you, you know, when you hear something that's you know, a, there's a dumb idea, I guess. You know, so you hear something and you think, well, that's that's stupid. I, I mean much stronger than that. I mean a, a more visceral reaction that, that tells you something is uncomfortable. Um, so I always talk about like come up with something that's dangerous or something that's immoral or something that's bad for business. You know, I, we're talking about in the safe space of ideas, not we're not talking about taking action unethically or dangerously, but we're talking about a creative process that ex examines things with those characteristics. Uh, I think this picture I actually think it's from Melbourne. No dickhead sounds like something from this country, not from, not from the United States where I'm from. Dickheads, right? There's like a, you gotta say it the right way. I can't even say it the right way. All right, so uh, we'll start with a little exercise. Everyone, does anyone not have two stickies or a pen? Joe's gonna take care of you if you don't. At the back, there's a few at the back. You're not getting a pen no matter how many times you put your hands up. <laughs> All right, so uh, it's, it's a multi-step exercise, and I'll sort of move you along. Uh, we don't want to get sort of drowned in, in each, little, each little thing. So what I want you to do is come up with, uh, on, your, on your first sticky note, come up with an idea. You can sketch it, or you can just write it. It should be just a few words. Come up with the worst idea for a product, a service, a feature, um, you know, something that a business could do. Um, and again, bad is not like, oh, that's kind of dumb. I mean, like really bad. So here's, here's the example in there. Uh, candy for breakfast, uh, right, a rocket with an auto launch capability in it, uh, an angry lion that lurks behind a glass so a baby can play with it. I think we actually have that. Um, yeah, all right, so I will give you just a couple of minutes. I'll sort of monitor to see if people are, are, are ready, but snap to it, come up with your, your idea. Don't, don't talk to anybody about it. Just solitary activity for now.
are still writing. Some are done, some are still writing. Do like another minute, kind of, minute or so. Get the 20 seconds, and then we're going to go on to the next step. Okay, uh, so let me just explain the next couple of steps before you start doing it. Uh, I don't want to, because a little more uh, action for you but I, I just want to hold your focus for another, another second. So in a moment, um, I want you to pass your idea to somebody else, hence the, the sticky note. Uh, and then what I want you to do when you receive uh, the bad idea from somebody else is use your second sticky note. What I want you to do is design the circumstances whereby that bad idea becomes a good idea. So here's my example, right? Uh, you know, candy for breakfast. Um, you know, the honeybees, colony collapse disorder, the sugar, naturally occurring sugar in the, uh, you know, in our food supply is disrupted. And so we put candy into breakfast so that we, uh, that we make sure we're getting our natural sugar part of our diet. So it's just a way to flip the thing. Um, okay, so take a couple minutes, swap your idea with, you don't have to directly, I mean, I don't care what the, the, the direction is, just get a different idea, create the circumstance that turns that bad idea into a good idea. And then we'll pick a few and talk about them. I'll give you a couple more minutes, but who's, who's done with this exercise already? Okay, cool. Just we'll do a, another minute or so, and then we'll talk, we'll pick a few and talk about them. Do you want to run that around to do yeah, it? Yeah, okay. then we can pick it up as well. Okay. Okay, in 30 seconds, we'll, we'll pick a few and hear from them. So think about if you're ready to volunteer.
So what would be great would be to hear the, um, the idea you received and the, the new thing that you created. We'll just, we'll pick a few. So the idea that I had was um, pushing a button and then getting punched in the face. <laughs> and the good solution was um, if you're doing like agility fitness training, basically the, the changes the game. So you've got to try and punch the punching bag or the punching thing. And if you don't, if you're not fast enough, then you get punched in the face. Very so nice. it's training through um, punishment, I guess. Very nice. <laughs> Who else? The idea that I got was uh, a bicycle with inverted controls, meaning you push left, it goes right, and the other way around, plus a petrol engine heater. So I would turn it into a brain trainer because it's known when you use your brain to do different yeah. things, helps your, your mental health, and then the engine would be used to analyze the, you know, everything that's going on, plus you do physical activity and generates more energy. Wow. Awesome. That's Great. Right. Hands up. Volunteers. Okay. Um, the, the first one I had was Tiger in daycare. And yeah. so, and so um, <laughs> that's pretty good. And so I changed it so that uh, tiger, it's a world where tigers have become sentient and they need a way to educate their children. Um, nice. and, yeah. Right. The scythe by the, the trick, the, the, high, the, the hack for those exercises. Always go for a sci-fi scenario. Or like, yeah, that's good. Right, thank you. Um, mine is a 13-hour clock. And my idea is a clock that run on the time it actually uses, and all the extra time goes to the extra 13th hour. Wow. All right. These are great, you guys. Any more? We have one, in this, one right behind you. So the idea was a hand trap, so something that closes on your hand when you place your hand in it, with teeth. Um, and so my solution is easy dieting. You have it at home, you put your favorite <laughs> treats in there, and then eventually you'll associate that treat with like getting your hand nice. bit, so. Very good. Probably won't eat it. Uh, so the bad idea that I was given, I think, is already an awesome idea, which was a vending machine that decides what you should eat. Though I imagine there's sort of some um, issues around fat shaming and other culturally inappropriate things, but I think it could work really well for busy people with no time to think about nutritional needs. And I think it, the way it could work is if it offers you salad, you could go away and perform 10 jumping jacks and then you'd get the Twix bar you were craving. That's really good. I, and I like, there's some variability how people are doing this. Some people are, um, you know, recontextualizing. I think the sci-fi thing is changing the conditions, which changes the idea. And then I think there's also this, this sort of tweak the idea slightly. You've kept the core of the idea, but you've added something very slightly, and suddenly it opens up to something else. Um, was there anybody that, uh, and, and this is an unfair question, but I'm going to ask it anyway because I have the microphone. Was there anybody that uh, found this exercise challenging that maybe wants to say a little bit about what they were grappling with doing this. It's fine if no one ha has that. But oh yeah, all right, thank you. So the idea I got was um, robocalls, automated calling for debt collection. I didn't really come up with anything good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone? So but is, who's that? That's a good idea for them, but how do you flip it to be a good idea for you? Making it not All right. Good. I'd like to get money back off. Sorry. <laughs> it might be useful to have uh, an automated uh, system to do that for you. Ah, okay, so you're redirecting the, right. When we hear that idea, we think we're getting the robocalls. You're like, no, this is consumers using robocalls against corporations. Yeah, all right, yeah. That's kind of where, that's kind of where you were directing us. Good. All right, thanks for doing that. Uh, it's always fascinating to see kind of where people go with this. Um, 
Um, and I, I mean, I think it, this is a meant to prove a simple point, which is, you know, the, well, a few things. One is the power that we have to reframe things, right? That's the classic designers, creative persons reframe. You're handed something and you look at it in a different way. I mean, that's extremely creative. Uh, but all the things that you were given were promised to be the worst things that we could come up with. And even under those circumstances, you're still able to, you know, within the constraints of a little exercise, find something positive in them. So that is sort of, you know, point one, I think, in illustrating how powerful bad ideas are, or at least how we shouldn't be limited by that framing of them, because you can turn them into something else. And, and the kind of thinking that goes, in, I think you did two very weird and cool kinds of thinking uh, with, with coming up with these terrible things, thank you, and then reframing them. So even just in five minutes, we really played with some, some very deep creativity. And that's, you know, I think, in the direction I want to talk about with for the rest of our time. Um, you know, a little bit here in, in, uh, uh, in the processes that I see when, when groups are doing brainstorming, when they're developing ideas, uh, I see sort of these two, these two humps. Uh, and so when you give a group sort of a problem about some, something to fix, they kind of go into fixing mode at first. When you're just doing, you know, open-ended brainstorming, the first things that I see people come up with are low-hanging fruit ideas. These are ideas that we've already talked about it, our competitors have it, it's sort of obvious, it exists in the world, and that doesn't mean that's, that's a poor outcome. That just means, you know, we need to kind of go through this, capture these things, write them up, um, and then what I often see groups do is, you know, notice this end, this, the energy kind of drops off. And sometimes people think, oh, we're done. We got it. We kind of got it. And if you give people more time or encourage them to keep going, you get this second, second takeoff kind of happens, the second pump. And this is kind of where I see uh, innovative ideas, breakthrough ideas, wacky ideas. And I want to be careful about what kind of judgment is implicit in what I'm saying about these two. They're both, I think they're both necessary. And you know, if you're working on a product or a service, you should definitely be putting these changes in. And this session and capturing them you're having is a good time to do that. But also something else is happening over here. And I think if you stop and walk away once you've captured all the Me Too ideas, then you miss out on the opportunity to have different kind of thinking, which you guys just did super quickly in this last exercise. But we don't tend to jump to that sort of thinking in our when we're at work because we're fixing things and we're trying to do a good job. But something else happens here. We look at things differently. And most of this stuff is going to fail. We would never go forward with it. It's not meant to say these are all going to be good ideas or successful ideas. This is a different form of thinking. Uh, and so I think you can use bad ideas as a way to kind of ensure that you get into that second mode of thinking by being very intentional about them. Uh, and one thing is that you know, when we work together and we're being creative, we need a safe place. I know that phrase is overused at this point, but um, you know, I think it's okay to laugh. And I think the difference between laughing at the ideas that we come up with versus laughing at the people that came up with them is, is, is a different way of setting the tone. Um, you know, listening to each other and really uh, doing all the best practices in collaboration and brainstorming and listening, you know, it, it is helpful for this. If you can't create those kinds of environments where you trust each other, then you can't come up with weird, bad, different uh, uh, ideas. You can't have that kind of uh, collaboration that happens. And these are actual examples out of uh, a colleague of mine ran a, a brainstorm for hand care for a consumer packaged goods company. And uh, they actually made some of these products, um, or, or there's the, the root of some of the things that got shipped are in these ideas that were in the brainstorm. Uh, so the Bellagio fountains, um, celebrity pop-up uh, boxes telling you to wash your hands. Like these are clearly bad ideas, right? But they, they led to some further action in the, in the product development process that led to things coming out uh, in the market. I, I, so when I look at how groups are, are interacting, I see kind of two bad idea sharing tactics. Um, and so the first is kind of the provocation. That's where people are talking and they're stuck and then you just come out with something to really try to mess everybody up. Uh, well, what if we uh, brought uh, you know, baby leopards into the uh, user kiosk and gave them to everybody? 
what? And you're doing that to, to, to what, you're doing that intentionally to get everybody unstuck. And so no one is necessarily going to take you seriously. You can be kind of silly about it, but you're putting something you know, on the table kind of creatively for people to examine and to work with. That's a getting unstuck technique. That's one. The other is, uh, it usually comes out like this. OK, I don't think this is a very good idea, but I say that before you suggest something. I think this is a bad idea. And, and partly that's because we're just working things out as we're talking. And you want to say what it is, but your brain hasn't quite sorted out what it is. And you're not, you're not comfortable. And those are really, really important ideas, because often you're just saying it's not a good idea. It's, it's a bit of confidence. And it's OK to frame it that way. But you, when you hear your colleagues and, your, and your, your collaborators say, this isn't a good idea, you want to take it in and say yes to it. Right? Because often when someone does that, it is a good idea. They just they are apologizing for it as a way to kind of protect themselves. So those are really important moments of kind of creating trust and, and taking ideas in and, and building. So yeah, one, pro, one is to provoke. The other is to tell someone that uh, your idea is, is basically not finished being baked. And in and, and both times, we, have, we can kind of react to those. Uh, so for yourself, um, you want to be, be able to hear your own reactions. Uh, when something tells you, when someone says this is a bad idea, either one, you start thinking, you start reacting to it, you start processing, and you kind of want to, you know, just be cognizant of what that that process is and harness it. That reaction, I think, is really an important way that the bad ideas you're getting are feeding you. I like this example here. Uh, this guy wrote about uh, working with his colleagues or uh, with his colleagues trying to decide where to have lunch. And everyone says, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. And so he says, all right, let's go to McDonald's. And in that case, oh, I don't want to go to McDonald's. Let's go here, let's go here, let's go here. He says, we've broken the ice with the worst possible idea. And he calls it the McDonald's theory. People are inspired to come up with good ideas to ward off bad ones. That's a brilliant piece of facilitation. Right? And so you throw the bad idea out there to kind of disrupt people's thinking. And in this case, get people to move along and, and come up with something else. Uh, right here, I just love this quote. It's the most pretentious thing for me to read this quote at the bottom, but I will. Good design has an element of surprise or provocation, of grit in the emollient flow of appropriate aesthetics. <laughs> That is such a, that's such a great thing. That, that this, even design is kind of its core is to surprise you with something unexpected to kind of redirect you. That's kind of what we're talking about. Um, and and, and the, the sort of desire of the brain or just the brain being wired to, to redesign dissonance. It was a lovely way of putting it when I read that. Um, so you get a bad idea and you start thinking like, no, 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 not McDonald's, no, not you know, free, free leopards. Like, you want to start, and it's not that you start trying to sort out the world that you're imagining and articulating. So that, that way that the bad idea prompts you to make something new, make something better, it's what we did in the exercise, right? And you, you know, I think for most people to be able to take that and just, you know, lean into that flip, uh, I think is really powerful. There's definitely a connection here to improv. I kind of alluded to that. You know, um, who, has, who has done improv here? All right. Who has ever seen a talk at a conference or professional setting about improv? Right? It's, it's, we talk about it a lot, I think, in, in, uh, in UX and in design. Uh, I, I do. I think it's really fascinating. Uh, the principles, I think, are really interesting. Um, and so the process words, I think, in, in improv are, are kind of cool. Um, uh, so you know, in improv, there's a, a game or a sketch or a scene that it's there. Maybe some there's a lot of rules and constraints that define it, but the specifics are are left open. And so then you have to have these kind of design principles, these creative principles. Uh, and so one is about throwing an idea. So if people are doing improv and you come in and say, "Hey, what's going on? Uh, I don't know what's going on with you," scene starts to die, right? When you come in and say, "My head is on fire," now suddenly there's something to work with. So to do a good job at improv, you have to bring something in. You have to throw an idea. I love that idea, uh, that, that language of 
of, of throwing an idea. And then the, the corollary then is accepting offers. So when someone says, my head is on fire, you don't say, I'm a Starfleet captain flying a, uh, flying a, uh, in a spaceship. You, you, you have to accept that offer and do something with it. So those are great collaboration principles. Those are great for brainstorming and just working together in general. You have to bring something to the table and you have to take what you've heard and, and work with it. And, and of course, improv is it's all about bad ideas, right? Uh, you know, let's write a story about a guy whose head is on fire. That's not what you would choose to do. But it's sort of how you make the energy and the collaboration, the zing kind of happen in, in improv. Um, versus, you know, shutting it down. Um, no, that's not the case. So we, we know this cliche from through improv, we say yes, yes and something else. We don't say no to something. Uh, and I have a short video here. We'll, it's, uh, we'll see if it plays when I click it. Um, kind of a, you know, people know dark patterns was kind of an idea for, for UX to come around. These, like evil designs in, uh, in, uh, in UX. So I have an example of improv dark patterns. Uh, I don't know if anyone ever watched the show, the Ricky Gervais show called Life's Too Short. And people are nodding. So this is an excerpt from that. All right, do I need to click it here? All right, let's see. It's a bad let's let's do some improvisational comedy now. Uh, OK. Give us a scenario. Um, right, OK. Uh, you're a hypochondriac and, and Ricky's a doctor. Excellent. OK. Knock, knock. Come in. Hello. Oh, no, not you again. I've never been here before. So I, I thought, because you're a hypochondriac, you would have been to the doctors before. Don't presume. That's a backstory we didn't agree on beforehand. No, I know. That's improv, though, isn't it? You sort of go with the flow. Don't take notes. OK. Can we go again? Yep. Because you ruined that. Sorry. Why not? Come in. Hey. Hi, how's it going? What seems to be the problem? I've contracted AIDS. OK. Who <laughs> suggests that? Oh, um, you're a greengrocer and uh, Ricky comes in to complain. Tring. We're closed. I think the shop has to be opened for us to do the sketch. Okay. okay. Sorry. Tring. Yes. Um, I'd like to make a complaint. Uh -huh. of, yeah, I bought some fruit here yesterday, and when I got home, some of it was rotten. That's not my fault. Well, you know, it's your shop, and it was sold uh, on your premises, so. Uh huh. I uh, wasn't here. Uh, it doesn't matter. You know, you got. I to... was at the doctor's. Okay. I got AIDS. Thought you might have. Right. You heard why he was at the doctor, right? Because he has it. So those are the anti-patterns, right? I think he knows exactly why. That's not what we want to do. Uh, I think there's a moment, too, in, the, in these collaborations when something comes up that's a bad idea. Um, and wait, this, wait, who's the person that said, I think this is actually a good idea? Right? right? I, it, this, you, so you epitomize this. You're handed something as a bad idea, and it forces you and the group, ideally, to just to revisit your constraints. Well, wait, I actually think that's a good idea. Uh, and you, you do that really, really well. You, you, you saw the good in the bad idea. Uh, and, and so sometimes, in addition to all the other things we can do with bad ideas, we can stop and talk together about, well, what are our criteria? What makes for, and I don't mean kind of in the creative sense, I mean on our project, on our specific thing, what do we think is good? What do we think is bad? There's outcomes and you know, value propositions that are maybe unexamined or unshared. We're not aligned on those things. So when you expose something as bad and then challenge, just consider whether or not it's bad, that is, is, a, is a moment to process what your, what your group's values are. It's an interesting, an interesting outcome. Um, all right, so let's uh, just have some uh, different examples about bad ideas that we uh, see in the world when, where they start off as bad and sometimes they end up uh, is good. Um, and so just some examples of people examining their creative processes. Uh, so when Vince Gilligan was uh, putting together Breaking Bad, uh, here's what he says, I don't know if you could come up with a worse idea on paper for a TV show than Breaking Bad, unless you're actually trying to fail. Uh, and the show was, of course, creatively and you know, professionally successful, but started, I mean, his reflection on it was like, this is the worst thing I can come up with. 
uh, there's this there's this long long post uh, in this podcast where they look at the um, collaboration between uh, Spielberg and Lucas when they were brainstorming for three days I think on Raiders of the Lost Ark and uh, and uh, you know so the two of them are sitting there together and and George Lucas is realizing uh, Steven Spielberg has these bad ideas that like everything is coming up with this crap and and he's expecting this kind of creative golden genius to be just producing gems and just seeing clunkers and seeing clunkers and sort of feeling uncomfortable about where this collaboration was going. Um, and then uh, at a certain point, I think it kind of changes. The collaboration kind of changes and the, the narratives that they're spinning change and the good stuff starts to come out. In this case, I think they're, they're going through, you know, uh, maybe a sort of creative pit of despair and talking about bad stuff. Uh, but it doesn't have to be in a downward vector. It kind of turns the corner and they, they get to a point where they move through bad ideas and good ideas start to come out. Uh, and, you know, what we don't have is sort of connecting the dots, like how they were responding, what was sort of the dialogue. How did they stitch together new ideas out of the bad ideas? But it, it, it seems like there's something there. Um, yeah, oh, uh, so I was talking about jobs at the memorial at the, uh, you know, 2011. And, and he, he quotes Steve Jobs, here's a dopey idea. That's that same thing I said, right? Okay, this idea isn't very good, but. So even Jobs is kind of presenting things. Someone who by reputation we probably imagine the way they would present ideas would be how great they were and how much they demanded other people would do them. But in fact, he's still wrapping these ideas in this envelope of this is dopey. Um, and sometimes they were, uh, but then sometimes they were brilliant. Um, or sometimes they were simple. Um, yeah, he, un he better than anyone understood that while ideas ultimately can be powerful, they begin as fragile, barely formed thoughts, so easily missed, so easily compromised, so easily just squished. And if that isn't a, you know, a cry for that safe place to kind of give birth to ideas and to let them be bounced around among the team, I don't know what it is, that is really evocative for me. Uh, just some other examples. Uh, Cow Clicker was this game that uh, Ian Bogost, who's like a game theorist and writer and professor, came up with. And um, did anybody play Cow Clicker? You're, you, at least you know you know Ian or you know this game. Okay. I think the point of Cow Clicker it was kind of a comment on you know, that Farmville era of kind of online games. In Cow Clicker, you did nothing but click cows. I think they like changed colors, and it was. It was a little bit of performance art. This wasn't supposed to be like a great game. It was kind of a comment on the banality and the virality of a lot of these online games. It became his biggest game ever. So he set out literally to do something that was crap and it became successful. And I think he called it like a Frankenstein's monster. Like he didn't know what to do with that success that happened given that his intention was to make something that sucked. Uh, so even when we try to fail, sometimes we tap into something that's the core of that bad idea. Like all these bad ideas that we did, there was something in them uh, that manifests itself in a certain way that we were trying to say would fail, as was Ian, and then it, it succeeds in interesting ways. Uh, this is a few years ago already, but this was like a, a parody concept video that went around Silicon Valley. It was like a check-in app for everything. You could kind of rate things and check in them. So. Like the ice cube in this guy's glass could be checked in on, and you know, um, and it was meant to be a joke. It was, and, and uh, you know, the Wall Street Journal writes this article a few years ago about what happens to all these things. There ended up being a bidding war to fund this. Now, obviously, it didn't launch, but I mean, if you just getting money is an interesting measure of success for an idea, and given that they were saying this was bad, we're making fun of things that we think are good ideas with this bad idea. And someone says, yeah, can we give you money to build that? There's obviously a lot we could unpack about how that happens, but I think the, the unintended consequences of bad ideas is certainly uh, curious for me. Oh yeah, good and bad food ideas. Uh, uh, a waffle cone filled with, uh, this is a brand from San Francisco, Mitchell's, black walnut ice cream mixed with uh, sweet spicy fried chicken chunks and a cayenne uh, maple drizzle. Yeah, I, so to me, I, I eat a lot of weird food, but this, this the, the description, I just find so disgusting. Uh, and if you don't, like, that's, that's fine. Um, I, to me, I think just, uh, it's, it's interesting to sort of unpack why these are, why are 
some food idea is bad and some are not. Um, and you know, your mileage may vary for sure. Um, right here is um, uh, Voodoo Donuts from Portland, Oregon. If you've ever been to Portland, you know the donut place. They have like a really great bacon maple bar, which was, I mean, at this point in our culture, like this is already, we take this as normal now, whereas that was kind of a gross thing 10 years ago. And then Rogue Breweries, which is like a nice uh, uh, brewery in, in Oregon as well, comes up with a beer that's a voodoo donut, bacon maple bar flavored. And you can, if you just look at the look on my face, you can tell how it actually, well, I don't know what you, how you interpret that look. <laughs> it was good. You wouldn't want that to be your daily beer, but it tasted, it, it, it was, it, they did such a great job of achieving their creative grief. Make a, a good beer that tastes like this voodoo uh, donuts donut. They did a good job of that. And I start, made me start thinking about like why these things succeed or just don't succeed or what our expectation. We're not tasting them right now. We're just coming up with our own you know, narrative about what we would expect or what we would want. Um, Tarani syrup, do you guys have this brand here? It's like the syrup that uh, they have at, uh, that the barista uses to flavor your, your coffee drink. Right, the little the, the squirts. <laughs> Um, and so usually it's like whatever, it's, it's caramel or like, you know, chocolate or something like that. Um, yeah, chicken and waffles flavored syrup. Uh, yeah, everyone, so if this looks good to you, fine. It does not look good to me. Um, and then I just want to contrast this to Jones Soda. Do you guys have this brand here? Okay. Uh, they, their whole thing is like weirdly colored uh, and just sort of odd flavors, right? Here's their poutine flavor. I think they have an American Thanksgiving uh, turkey and gravy flavor. It's, yeah, ooh, but... Uh, and so, I mean, the thread to me here is kind of around, it's kind of around authenticity and curation, even though we're talking about, like, really disgusting combinations. Um, and again, sorry, this isn't a, re a relevant brand here, but these are not the people. They're making the, the caramel sauce to go in your, your, your macchiato at, uh, right, I realize no one would drink that here. It's land of flat whites, but in my country, a far off land, people do interesting things with coffee and put flavors in them. So I don't want those people being the chicken and waffle syrup people. This is just not a credible narrative. Uh, but Rogue, you know, very local, there's sort of a craft story about beer, taking sort of a hyper-local example and trying to replicate it, and even the design of it, um, you know, that sounds kind of appealing, you know, whereas this, I think, is just standing there being gross. Again, it's very subjective, but there's something here about who is qualified to carry a bad idea forward, who kind of has the, the uh, yeah, again, kind of the authenticity or the narrative about them that this makes sense. You know, so you could think about this is disgusting, but which place, like, I don't know, is there a place in Newtown that would serve this where you'd be like, well, maybe I'd best there. Hmm? Right. Okay. I know neither of those places, but there's a context there. Um, you know, there's no, no shortage of, like, really amazing, you know, beer purveyors where you would take a risk with them, and if they suggested something that was odd, uh, there's also plenty of people that have no business kind of breaking the frame and, and coming up with odd examples here. Um, oh, yeah. I, I think, and then, so I think well, there's a piece here about what happens in the marketplace as well. So we can sort of sit here and talk about what's good and what's bad and we're making things. But just like Cow Clicker, you put things out in the world and things happen. Um, and what do you, I, I don't know what the, the example would be here. Uh, grocery stores or any, any chain that sells things that have not succeeded in a regular marketplace. So this is like the, my local grocery store um, that sells things that are not available anywhere that you've never heard of. <laughs> Remember I said candy for breakfast? Well, here's ice cream scoops. Uh, and I like this one here. It's a baked puff snack made of uh, bow ties shaped pasta, which is already confusing. And it's meatball parm flavor. Oh, and it's Santa that is selling it. <laughs> um, so that's like how many bad ideas can we get in here, just cram into this. So, so no surprise that this is for sale in sort of the discount, uh, discount grocery store. Uh, again, just the context of the marketplace, weird, interesting things happen. Um, this is from, uh, in Austin, Texas, they do the South by Southwest Festival every year. 
Uh, this was a number of years ago because it was 4G that was the technology that, that goes back a few years. There was a lot of upset. Um, somebody hired uh, homeless people to be uh, hotspots. People remember when this happened? And it was, it was distressing because it was sort of seen as exploiting people. Uh, and you know, this is returning humans into sort of technical infrastructure for, for rich techies who are you know, entitled and fly into Austin to spend their money. And we're making homeless people, you know, serve up their their tech infrastructure like the most dehumanizing thing. They were they it was just a big press outcry. They had to apologize. At the very same event, uh, they had people <laughs> as human batteries to charge up your phone. Um, so you could ask, is being a battery or being a hotspot more dehumanizing? No one got upset about this at all. Uh, and in fact, so uh, these were not FedEx employees. I asked him. He's an, he's an actor. He responded to a Craigslist posting to do this. Um, it's essentially the same idea, right? But they sort of picked a target population that we don't know how to feel about. Like, is it okay to give these people money? It's, it's okay to give this guy money, but it's not okay to give this person money. And, and like, I'm not trying to come down on one side or the other. Like, I understand how this feels exploitive and this doesn't. Um, and so sometimes it's just uh, context and just the narrative that emerges that, you know, both groups were sort of trying to, both groups were paying people in a dehumanizing way to serve the same population. And we don't accept this, but we do accept that. Or maybe if someone had gotten upset about this, it would have also snowballed. So there's, there's a piece here about the marketplace, if you will, that we, we really can't control and that feels a little, um, sometimes a little ad hoc. Uh, right, this, you're right, these never made it to the marketplace, um, uh, but you know, they made it through renderings. And you know, I think you had just a pretty naive designer thinking about a childhood toy that they had and not seeing what symbols they were creating and how those would be interpreted by somebody else. Um, you know, the, the, the sort of association with chain gangs and slavery was not on this person's mind. So there's also kind of like corporate vetting, like, you know, you, it's not intended to be a bad idea, but it certainly was perceived as one. And uh, I think these illustrations got out and they like obviously killed us. They wouldn't release this. I'm curious too about bad ideas as kind of as art. Here's, I mean, this is basically someone's art project, which is uh, what the first exercise we did. Oh, it's a crib that's made out of glass that breaks into shards easily. Then you want to come up with that one? Like this, if someone had that one on their poster at the beginning of today, that would be exactly aligned with this. Um, right, I see furniture as being very much about the body. It's about giving support and comfort. Um, this is more about hostility than comfort. So. I mean, art, artists are very good at taking sort of familiar frames and breaking them or juxtaposing them as a way to make us pay attention to something that we have. And so we can look for them. We can look for this kind of creative process that we're talking about today. It's something I want you to keep doing. I'm sure you're already doing it. Uh, and I'd say look for these signals in other places that you go in your life. And you'll see it in art for sure. It's always it can often be an invitation to sort of challenge norms um, and, and make things that we wouldn't want. But you know, this sits in a museum. I think this, I think this is in the Tate Modern in London. OK, a little bit more about, just about you know, this kind of uh, thinking, bad idea thinking. I don't, I don't know that they run this anymore, but they used to have all these provocations on the site called uh, Dangerous Ideas, this thing, Big Think. They'd have all these different ideas, tax fat people, make software free, uh, eliminate funding for special education. There, you know, at, at obviously, we live in times now where people put forth horrible things, like, uh, and, and we, anyone that's on Twitter is fighting about these things all the time. So if we could pull out of that context for a moment, these are not meant to be you know, political stances. They're meant to be provocations, just like we did at the beginning of the, the class. The class, what is this? Uh, the, thing that we're doing now that I don't have a noun for. Uh, that what? The event. Thank you. Uh, that's my jet lag propping. Uh, so, so here's a safe place on a website to get together and examine intentionally bad ideas and kind of consider the merit of them, the risks of them, separate from um, you know, what 
what sort of things were triggered if we were to actually talk about doing this in a different environment. Um, it's too bad they don't run this because I think you know, these kinds of spaces for examining our assumptions are, are really important and really valuable. And again, this would be very hard to do online. You need a lot of moderation. There's a big thing about trust here, like I keep saying. We want to talk about something, you know, uh, fat shaming already came up here today. I mean, here's like a, you know, enculturated economic fat shaming thing. How can we have a conversation about that that is sort of safe and creative and forces us to think about other things that isn't hurtful? That takes a lot of effort. Um, if we don't have to accomplish that, we have to, you know, in our lives, I think we have to find ways with each other to talk about whatever bad ideas we wanted and sort of delineate those as such as this is a place where we can talk this way. Um, obviously, in our work is different than in our politics. We have a little more, hopefully a little more control. Um, I mean, there's just, there's obviously a big root in this. Um, I don't know, when I was in a school, we had to read and talk about the, a modest proposal. Does anyone, anyone know this? Right, so this is, uh, this is basically uh, describing that the economic troubles that the Irish had in whatever period of time this was, uh, if they could sell their children as food for rich gentlemen and ladies, um, then that would, uh, you know, deal with, solve the economic thing. So this is, you know, in school when you learn about what satire is, it's not about comedy, it's about taking an idea. And, and you know, Swift writes this essay and he just fleshes the whole thing out. It's, it's quite persuasive if you accept sort of the initially horrifying transgressive proposition. So it's a little bit of an intellectual exercise. So what we're talking about is, you know, goes back far, 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 far. And I think this was you know, a distressing thing that was sort of thrown into society uh, intentionally to kind of comment on the abject way that you know, the, the Irish poor were in a terrible situation. And that was uh, an unusual way of commenting on it. Again, there's just, there's just so much context to this. Um, right, and so here's, uh, so on the left is uh, this sort of famous spot in Austin. I have a couple of awesome examples here. It's this I love you so much graffiti on South Congress. And it's a local landmark. Uh, I think it got painted over, then they recreated it. It has its own check-in spot on Foursquare. People posing for pictures in front of this is like a common sight. Um, you know, and then I like uh, this, this, this uh, I never stop loving you. Um, uh, I don't know if it is, I assume, I assume that it's still there in, in Brisbane in the Gallery of Modern Art. Um, it's sort of the same piece, right, except one is uh, like graffiti, local landmark. The other is this, uh, you know, modern art piece valued at however much money that's in a gallery and, you know, thousands of miles from where it was created. Um, but, you know, obviously what is art is like a whole thing I'm not even prepared to, to unpack. But again, these are sort of bad ideas or, 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 you know, graffiti is sort of a bad idea that gets put out in the world and, and then recontextualized and recontextualized and recontextualized the meaning starts to shift. So again, just like the uh, hot spot and just like the, you know, the shoes with the shackles on them, you know, things keep changing shape and, and ending up in different parts of the world and we attach different meaning on them. So if nothing else, it's a reason to not make something a bad idea and shut it down too quickly um, because things can change as, a, as they take on shape in the world and we want to, you know, let them blossom. I think that's scary too because we then see terrible things happen when you know a company gets shut down for you know exploiting the homeless. So there's risks here for sure. Um, oh yeah, here's a. I mean, <laughs> this is another spot of Austin. It's a photo of the original piece of graffiti. So there's kind of a representation thing here. Now it's not even the real thing; it's a, a printing of it. Uh, all right. So just to wrap up, uh, I want to say porno viral uh, for no reason I can, I can imagine. Um, so context, I keep hammering this notion of context. Uh, oh, I like this thing that engineers say, if it's stupid but it works, it's not stupid. That's not a thing a designer would say, right? But it's a thing that an engineer would say, and, and, and I like that. It, it makes a lot of sense. Um, it sort of acknowledges that, you know, that bad ideas can succeed and we don't worry, we worry about the success more than you know, the label we put on at the beginning. Um, yeah, I think we've kind of talked about these things. Uh, and so one should wrap up with Thomas Paine, The Age of Reason from 1795. I'm sure you all have copies on your Kindle, on your phone, if everyone wants to bring that up. Um, 
The sublime and the ridiculous are often so nearly related that it is difficult to class them separately. Or it's such a fine line uh, between stupid and clever. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank you, Steve. There actually is in Sydney a festival of, of dangerous ideas. Festival of, yeah, Fest, FODI. Festival of Dangerous Ideas where they have speakers come and be provocative and get shut down on Twitter. <laughs> um, questions? You're joking, right? <laughs> John? Hi, Steve. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Fantastic talk. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. I have a, there, were, there was a kind of a meta idea that you talked about, which was about trust. And then there was a small example of a strategy, the McDonald's strategy. And I wanted to kind of ask a question that intersected those two points. So, I, and I loved that idea of the McDonald's strategy. But how do you do that without um, unintentionally compromising your own credibility? Imagine there's someone in that lunch group who think, oh, Elle really wants to go to McDonald's. <laughs> Which obviously I wouldn't. <laughs> it was a strategy. But, you know, how, 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 do I <laughs> how do I balance that fine line? Do you have it? And I, I suspect some of the ideas, the, the, the answer might be around trust and establishing trust. But I expect you have some lovely um, examples of how you can kind of build that credibility so yeah. that you can... Right, and the McDonald's example is interesting because it's at work, but it's sort of outside the performance of work. So, right, you can have a meeting and you can say at the beginning of the meeting, here's how we're going to work together, here's the rules. I mean, companies create a lot of culture, put up posters. There's, but now you've, you've, you've picked an interesting moment in that story, right, where it's not, it's at work, but it's not during work. It's in the building, it's about going out of the building. So you're in kind of a transition. And right, that new person that joins the company that thinks Elle is not a, a gastronomically brilliantly creative person that you actually are, and that would go to McDonald's, like that's a risk. Um, well, so I mean, in that scenario, that's one person versus that person is being normed into the group's rules. So, right, you're sitting there with seven or eight people saying, "Let's go to McDonald's." One person thinks, "The hell," but everyone else kind of knows how to work with you. Um, so. I think you know you wouldn't want to do the McDonald's strategy your first day in a you know as a consultant or coming in and saying like let's go to McDonald's You're like I don't know you or I, I don't have trust with you I don't understand how you work and how you establish frames and break them um, you'd want to start trying to make your mark in collaborative sessions and 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 calling out what the rules are okay we can come up with bad ideas here we're gonna I'm gonna suggest that today we're allowed to talk about things that will hurt the bottom line as a way of being creative, right? You're, you're announcing the frame. But I think that's just, that example is a difficult time to, to do it. Um, thank you, Steve, for your, for your talk. And um, when I saw the homeless person as a hotspot, I do remember that and how, how much it was sort of criticized at the time. Just an idea, it could have been reframed as you stay in touch with that homeless person or you help that homeless person by accessing that hotspot. Could have made it a lot better. I'm, I'm not saying that would have been a great idea, but could have made it better. Do you have a technique for how you can test a potentially transgressive idea before it launches? So by bringing in critiques or, or how, how, do you make, how do you avoid such a blunder? Yeah. I mean, uh, I mean my profession is user research, right? I'm, I'm trying to... Uh, you know, before we come up with ideas, we're trying to have principles and, you know, uh, not just let's make this thing, but, you know, so uh, an overarching framework that can help us, you know, consider ideas. But um, I'm also advocating that we, we show them to people. We, you know, and figure out sort of who and how and when and how refined. I um, mean, I think the, obviously there's, there's a landmine, right? You could, you could imagine the bad focus group you could do that would make that idea, the homeless person idea, succeed. Um, and so figuring out, um, you know, I mean, just to be kind of crude about it, like being trying to figure out where you have your head up your own ass, right? 
like when knowing what your blind spots are would be maybe a more elegant way to say that. Um, so you know, a, a culture that understands itself and understands what its weaknesses and, and what its default assumptions are, um, and that's that's I think that's an ongoing effort. I am just uh, I mean, certainly in Silicon Valley where I spent a lot of time. I'm amazed at how much how organizations are trying to be very insular. Um, Oh, so there's, here's, an, a, 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 here's an example. Uh, you know, they, I think this happens everywhere. They try to bring in big companies into locations by giving them tax incentives. Um, and, uh, and so what's the, the, the big one that's kind of contentious right now in San Francisco is Twitter moved into a very depressed area in San Francisco and they gave them all kinds of tax incentives. And they built the best cafeteria imaginable, as a lot of these companies do. And, so, and, and the deal was you move into the the community, we give you tax breaks, the community grows as a result. Uh, but what happens is you have people kind of arriving on transit, going into the building, spending all day in the building, consuming the amazing amenities that tech companies in the Bay Area are providing. I got a tour of Google where they showed me the, the ping pong room. It wasn't the room to go play ping pong, it was the room that your ping pong coach would come in to work with you when you hired a, a personal trainer just for ping pong. So the levels of just, you know, demand for, uh, uh, and, and so people are not leaving the facilities and they're not entering the community. They just approved, uh, I forget the company in San Francisco, but they said you can't make your own cafeteria. You have to have people going out into the community. That's, so this is, that's a long answer here, but I think just look at what kind of culture that creates where uh, everyone uses the products, talks to each other, uses the same lingo, you know, goes to the cafeteria and talks kind of gossip about what people are doing as these companies are creating these massive separate cultures um, you know, to build all the values that they care about and, and retain employees, they are also being so disconnected from the world. And so, I don't know, my answer to you is like, yes, you can have all the user research and testing thing, but boy, it'd be great to have a culture that, you know, where you existed in the world that everybody else exists in and talk to them and talk like them um, as a way to you know, it's a much, much harder, uh, you know, easier to say go do eight weeks of research or something than to change the culture and how you operate a business. But ultimately, like, you have to be connected to the world as it is to not come up with, like, a homeless thing. I don't understand that because a lot of our UX processes would have passed that. I think. A long answer, sorry. <laughs> but a good one. Hello? Anyone, any more questions for Steve? Back there. Oh, oh, ah. I guess slightly less practical more to your experience. Do you have a story where, say, you've used this technique and it has given birth to something you regret? So something which got created as a result of this technique and you're just kind of screaming as it leaves the door, oh, wait, no, please, no, wait, that was just the icebreaker. Mm. I, w I wish I did because it would be a, a good story. I mean, I, I think I get what's behind your question. Um, you know, I work so far up from where things leave the door that, um, you know, I would just be happy if things would leave the door from the processes <laughs> that I'm involved in. Um, it's, a, it's a good question and I think, you know, not to put words in your mouth, but I mean, there's risks here for sure as well and I, I think I've said there's not all, there's, I think I told you there's risks here. Um, yeah, I don't know. Have you ever put something out that didn't leave the door, and then you're like, "Oh crap! I wish I hadn't done that." <laughs> All right. Good. We have a follow-up, a flip. Hmm. Right. Things that started off as a good idea and ended up as a bad idea. Or it started as a somewhat bad idea and it got. Mm. Yeah, again, I just, I, I'm so much in the idea part of it and so much less in the shipping part of it that, uh, I mean, you know, what I see is nothing getting shipped and, and so I see opportunity missed, which uh, um, you see, when I see competitors doing what we told someone was an opportunity three years ago, that's sort of the, that's where I have more of my frustration and regret and less about um, you guys botched this or you guys missed the core of it. Um, 
at least top of mind, that's kind of where I go with it. I, I like these questions, and they're just, I'm probably just not the person to, to have a story for them. Plays into that. Um, <laughs> kind of complete brain fart. Um, yeah, uh, do you, when you have these bad ideas, does everybody within the meeting or the group that you're in know that you're purpose, purposely coming up with these? Or is it just there in the dark and you're going to do it and, and see what they take from it? I mean, what has been successful for me is to set up, you know, we're going to do a session is to set up the framing of that a little bit. Sometimes I'll leave, you know, that, that two hump curve? Like, I'll, sometimes I'll show a few slides to people and say, okay, we're gonna do this. Um, here's kind of, uh, here's some things to keep in mind. Um, so it's a little bit of modeling the behavior and kind of teaching best practices and executing. Um, so that way it gives me a little control. I mean, I'm a, I'm a consultant, I don't work in-house, so it's often a new team, and they're getting something unique or weird or different or special, and I don't, and we don't know each other, so I can use that as a moment to say, here's, here's what can be successful. Um, you know, I think teams that work together all the time, they start to, you know, that's like being in a band, right? You can hear each other without looking at each other. I think they can, they create some, some safe spaces over time. But for me, I think just announcing it at the beginning and even making it kind of teachy by putting it in slides, I think can kind of help. I mean, sometimes we'll do an improv exercise um, and debrief on it and talk about ideas and talk about saying yes. And, you know, let them uh, come to something kind of new about it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, in, in a short, like trust obviously is built over time. I don't have that time, but I can at least set ground rules and point them. But there's obviously like a 90 second version of that, right? You have a meeting with a group of people, right? Uh, you know, pull out your IDEO met brainstorming method cards or whatever design thinking PDF that, you know, was, got tweeted 20 minutes ago. There's so much out there or just, you know, tell people what you want and why. Um, I, I think it's absolutely a great and valid way to go. Go this one at the back. Hi, following up a bit on the conversation before, I'm curious, what's your opinion about what is the role of a designer? Is a facilitator or the one who should come up with the ideas? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> should the ideas why, come why from designers? Or? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I mean, we are, any of us would be blessed to have multifaceted careers and be able to play different kinds of roles um, that are, you know, specific to the environments that we work in and what our personal strengths are. Um, yeah, uh, I saw a talk a few years ago by um, Michael Kronthal, who's a user research leader at Uber, and uh, he was at Yahoo then, but he talked about, he was talking about design research specifically. But he put this great diagram up that uh, could find it on the web, but I can't kind of uh, spontaneously uh, recollect it accurately. But he listed sort of three or four roles for a researcher. You know, and one of them was um, uh, like the Sherpa that takes people up Everest. So you know, you take people. Another one was like a connector or a bridge builder. He, he had these little diagrams with like people and ideas and what the researcher was doing. Um, and he was kind of saying that I kind of like you, right? There's a range of them, but I think where he nets out, and I agree, that it can be circumstantial, it can be kind of individual to you, it can be to your, you know, your environment. Um, and it's the nice thing about working on a team is we fill in for each other's strengths. So there's someone that's really good at wrapping up. There's someone that's really good at opening up. Like you might be the guy to say, here's what we're gonna do today, and, and, and inspiring us. But you might be terrible at wrapping the meeting up. It's fine, like someone else is gonna say, Okay, I think we're done. Here's everybody's action items. You know, I, I, there's so many sort of sub skills to being a good collaborator, to creating trust, to making these processes happen. You know, find your strengths, use them, 
figure out what your weaknesses are and build them is my advice to you. You weren't asking for advice, you were asking me to define something, <laughs> which I refuse to do, but. Yeah. That's prolonging. Thank you. Turn things around. Time for one more. Oh, that was, there we go. Hi there. I'm a design student, and I want to know what do you feel that design students need to know before they get into the workforce, coming from bad ideas and good ideas? What do they need to know about this? I mean, you just, you just sat through it. Just go graduate. <laughs> You're set. Um, well, I, I mean, I don't know. This may be unfair, but like, w look where we're having this conversation. It's Sunday. Uh, which, I mean, thank you for coming here on a Sunday. Um, and, and I think, I, I, this is an unfair, old person sounding thing, but in school you're allowed to be creative. Like, that, I, sorry for saying that, but um, that, you know, that's the brief, right, is to, is to explore the edges of things. And you're obviously going to face judgment, but you, ex you, ex you experience a certain kind of judgment. Um, I feel like this is really important. But, and I think the questions kind of illustrate, you've got to be careful how you navigate this in the work environment. I mean, what meeting do you want to say, uh, what if our product was free? What if our product had electric shocks in it? You know, what if we just copied you know, Uber's business model and broke the law? Like, you have to be careful how to say that. And yet, I believe kind of to be successful creatively, there's a real opportunity if you do do that. So, I think the, the creative skills, you know, you know, keep going, but figuring out the political context or what's okay. Um, and, and I think you have the opportunity, we all have the opportunity to lead people through this. This is not comfortable. Um, so how can you, you know, as a new person entering the work world, how can you uh, sort of confidently faci facilitate up, uh, not even lead up, but just facilitate up to to think in a way that's like bad and dangerous and scary. It's the opportunity and, and it's the challenge. Well, I know nothing about you, so that's why. <laughs> Let me tell you. Well, that's a nice point to wind up on. Thank you, Steve. And hey, thank all of you guys for coming.